from New Hampshire. It's time for the Science Cafe! Learn about the latest technological innovations today. And you don't have to pay. Expert panels with advanced degrees are sure to satisfy your curiosity. Did we mention it's free? And if you think you'll find a better time than this, then come on down and test your hypothesis. Because you're going to learn a lot if you want to stay. Down at the Science Cafe. Hello again, and thank you for returning to join us as we continue our 11th season of Science Cafe New Hampshire. My name is Rick Irving, and I'm happy to be your host and moderator for our September 2021 session entitled Exploring the Kingdom of Fungi. Mushrooms straddle the line between the plant world and the animals, and in some ways, they are more closely aligned to animals. Science continues to learn about the many benefits of the amazing fungi. From medical to agricultural to food, these incredible organisms hold many secrets. Agriculturally, there are businesses springing up to grow mushrooms. The most convenient way of raising mushrooms may be with the kits that come with the spawn already inoculated into toaster-sized blocks of sawdust, wood chips, and grains. These kits are shipping at a rate of 20000 per year and have generated their own inoculation parties including some teaching workshops in universities. The medicinal use of mushrooms dates back thousands of years. Medical mushrooms can benefit such things as immune support, anti-inflammatory health, and support brain health and cognition, and many more things. Magic mushrooms are increasingly being studied for psychological benefits, and in the coming weeks, a study in the New England Journal of Medicine will reveal their findings, highlighting the benefits of treating depression with the psychoactive ingredients of mushrooms. And although there are an abundance of wild mushrooms in many areas of the country, a small few of the 70 to 80 species can be very dangerous to eat. They can even kill you. Tonight, Science Cafe will look to unearth some of these mysteries with an incredible panel of mushroom hunters, growers, and hobbyists. As most of you know, at Science Cafe, we provide our audience with the opportunity to interact with our expert panelists to get scientific answers for the many questions you have on this interesting topic. Before I introduce our panel to, and get your questions, I have a couple of procedural comments. Please use the comment section of Facebook or YouTube to submit your questions for our panel. Our colleagues will collect them and forward them to us during the session. Please be succinct with your questions, and if you would, purely for general interest purposes only, include your name and location. You may start submitting your questions now and for the remainder of our session. We will get to as many of your questions as our time this evening permits. Thank you. Okay, and now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our panel for this evening. My name is Rick Irving and I'm joining you from North Carolina, but our two participants on the expert panel are joining from the state of Maine. So I would give a brief introduction basically of their current credentials and give them a chance to tell us about themselves, their interests, their experience, and their background. And let's start with Lewis. Lewis Giller spent a decade studying, growing, foraging, and eating mushrooms. He studied environmental science at the University of Denver and conducted oyster mushroom research while there. He's currently at the North Core Mushrooms in Maine, which does production, education, and community outreach. And Lewis also leads people on mushroom walk. Mushroom kits, as I mentioned earlier, are coming from North Shore. So both Rachel and Lewis will be able to tell us about those. Lewis, can you take a few minutes and tell us about your background, your interests, and your experience? Sure. Thank you, Rick. Uh, things did start for me at the University of Denver. I was taking an ethnobotany class, uh, and the professor, Martin Quigley, I uh, was very excited to sponsor student research and a buddy of mine had read this book by Paul Stamets called Mycelium Running um, and uh, was very inspired by it and was like, Lou, we should do something from this book. We should take this and, and, and you know, recreate some of the research and uh, get a grant. And that's exactly what we did. Um, and through that whole process, uh, I joined the Colorado Mycological Society and spent a bunch of time 
um, hunting mushrooms and reading books and was hooked from there. Um, and then from, from my time in Colorado, I spent time in Wisconsin, um, working on a farm, uh, multiple farms, and then the Pacific Northwest, both excellent mushroom places and then Vermont, um, and just always had, um, uh, uh, a hand in mushrooms, whether it was outdoor cultivation or indoor cultivation. Um, and so I realized once I started doing work with Norspore that I, I knew a thing or two um, and was able to really lead classes at that point. Great. Thank think, you, Lewis. Yeah. I appreciate it. And Rachel. Rachel Martin has her BA and her MS in biology and general sciences from Clark University in Massachusetts. She was a research assistant at the University of Maine and worked in the fungal pathology laboratory focusing on diseases of low bush blueberries. She is currently also at North, North Four Mushrooms and she is the spawn manager. Rachel, tell us a bit about yourself, your background, and what does a spawn manager do? Sure. Um, so I was always interested in fungi, but I really got started in college at Clark University. Um, I was fortunate enough that there is a mycologist there, um, Dr. David Hibbett, and he is a molecular systematist. So he takes DNA sequence data and builds phylogenetic trees and infers evolutionary relationships and taxonomic relationships from this data. So I was able to start working in his lab my sophomore year and continue on. Um, I did a master's in the same lab and I, my work mainly involved extracting um, and sequencing DNA and then building phylogenetic trees. Um, the project I worked on for my master's involved fungal endophytes, which are fungi that live inside plant tissue. Um, I worked on this project with Dr. Romina Gazis, and we collected leaf, she collected leaf and sapwood samples um, from rubber trees in Mexico, Cameroon, Brazil, wow. and one other place I'm forgetting. And so, yeah, after <laughs> that work, um, I went to the University of Maine, where I worked with Dr. Shauna Annis um, on fungal diseases of low bush blueberry. And this, this involves species such as rust, septoria, powdery mildew, and monolinia. And this, this work involved a lot of field research, crawling around on the ground, um, finding contaminated berries, and trapping spores with spore traps, and then going back to the lab and counting spores. Um, and so I joined the staff of North Spore um, three years ago. And yeah, I'm currently the lab manager. And so this work, involves um, propagating uh, fungal cultures, maintaining our culture bank, um, making master grain spawn, um, which we use. We'll, we'll get into what spawn is in a minute, but um, uh, making bigger bags of spawn, uh, just a variety of tasks here at North Spawn. Great. So now the first question for each of you, you've sort of partially mentioned this, but I'm interested to know how did you originally get interested in mushrooms and fungi? Was it when you went to college and learned about these things? Or did you have an interest in this sort of thing before that point? Lewis. Well, I just thought they were so strange <laughs> um, to, to begin with. I, I wasn't much of a mushroom eater. And I thought it odd that I hadn't learned much about mushrooms. You know, the entire kingdom, you know, fungi uh, or fungi um, had had sort of been glossed over a little bit um, in in my biology classes and stuff um, and so I, I wanted to learn more uh, it was it was really uh, mysterious and promising you know I, I started to learn about all the possibilities beyond food um, and all the all the things that that mushrooms can do and so uh, uh, it, it just kind of carried off uh, uh, with, you know, inspiration from there. Well, great. Thank you. And Rachel, what about you? Yeah, I agree that the mushrooms were really missing from my early life. Um, my mom's a bird watcher. We were always in the woods. And I remember focusing on plants and birds, but never fungi. And, and then at some point, 
um, I just developed a personal interest. So. Oh, okay. Um, and now we have our questions coming in. Hopefully the audience, we speak to them, will uh, ask more questions about the different aspects of this, the agricultural, the, the magic mushrooms, all those sorts of things. But our first question is, what types of organisms fall under the category of fungi? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, it's extremely broad. Uh, there are, I guess, depending on who you ask, uh, the, and the, the taxonomy is very complicated. This may be a better question for, uh, for Rachel. Uh, so please, Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are as many as seven different phyla um, that will fall under the kingdom fungi. Um, and I mean, you have, uh, everything there from, you know, your microscopic, uh, or I mean, your, yeah, your tiny little, uh, micro fungi and then the macro to, you know, giant puff balls. Um, uh, and, um, uh, yeah, I guess I should defer to Rachel really, who will be able to talk more about like the, the variation within the taxonomy than I can probably. Okay, yeah, Rachel. Um, the specifics of the taxonomy are escaping me, but it is, it's an entire kingdom of organisms. I, I don't remember how many species are currently described, but I think it's, it's probably, I think they estimate like 10% of what is out there. And traditionally, um, they found new species of fungi by culturing them. So I have a Petri dish right here. And so um, th that is very limiting because you're only culturing what will grow on the media that, that we've made. And so now we have environmental sequencing. So we can go out into the environment and get sequence data for things that won't grow on a Petri dish. And so that's revealing even more species. Um, so they're they're currently finding species every day. Wow! And um, do these they, they seem do they grow everywhere, in, everywhere in the in the world? They do. Yes. Yep. Okay. There's Seems even like marine grow. fungi. Okay. Uh, and it, next question is how do fungi reproduce? That's it's, very complicated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the topic of probably a whole and a whole nother talk for sure. Um, they can reproduce sexually or asexually. Um, and the, the, the process can be very complicated. Um, they can have, it's not just uh, two genders, you know, like we have male or female, there, there can be a variety of mating types. And it, yeah, it gets, it gets very complicated very fast. But on a basic level, you have um, asexual reproduction where um, asexual spores are produced called conidia. Um, and this is very common in mold species. Um, and then there's sexual reproduction where two compatible mating types uh, fuse. But, but the process is, is not straightforward. <laughs> they, yeah. they seem to show up very quickly and, uh, and almost everywhere, almost overnight. Yes, and, and the mushroom is the, the sexual uh, fruiting body. So everything underground um, is the, the vegetative um, growth. And then when sexual reproduction happens, that's when the mushroom is formed. Okay. And, and that, that material, that network, the web-like, usually white stuff that you see when you lift up a log or you dig, dig a hole, that's called mycelium, and there are miles and miles and miles of it uh, in the uh, in the soil and forest floor. Um, tons and tons of it in New England, um, and uh, given the right conditions, that's when it will produce mushrooms. Hmm. Okay, our next question is from Courtney Wood, who is my daughter, happens to be here in North Carolina. What are the most interesting benefits of mushrooms that are not commonly known? Well, uh, you know, there are there are a lot of things. I mean, with each species, um, there there are things that are broad that are like um, kind of common across them. Like, 
eating mushrooms has uh, is really good for you because of fiber content. Um, but then there's like really amazing individual benefits, like uh, um, the uh, there is with oyster mushrooms, which is the mushroom we grow the most of. Um, they have uh, natural statins. Uh, I think it's what's the what's the uh, statin that a lot of people take? Levastat, levastatin. Forgot, but it's it's a it's a natural compound that is similar and has a, a similar effect on the body. And um, you would need to eat a whole lot of oysters to have like um, you know a comparable effect. But over a lifetime of eating oysters regularly, um, you know, it can really, uh, help affect, uh, your cholesterol, um, through that. Okay. Now that's interesting. You mentioned eating the oysters and the oyster mushrooms. How are those two related? Oh, they're not oyster. So ah. mushrooms get, uh, most uh, mushrooms, unfortunately are always named after something else. It seems <laughs> we've got, <laughs> we've got, uh, oyster mushrooms and we've got chestnut mushrooms. Um, and, uh, there's, there's a variety of others. There's chicken of the woods. Um, and so they're always named after other, other creatures or foods or, uh, but oyster mushrooms the uh, they are pleurotus species. Um, pleurotus ostriatus is like the, uh, sort of flagship and, um, it's, it's common in the, in the woods, not, not super common, but it is, um, incredibly, good for the type of cultivation that we do at Norspor. Interesting. Okay. Next question is besides food and medicine, are there other roles fungi can play in society? Yeah. I mean, there are a whole bunch. Uh, <laughs> one thing that's super fun, uh, is uh one, one of my favorite mushrooms is reishi um and it's uh also a uh, great medicinal mushroom but when you grow reishi the blocks the reishi blocks become so dense and hard and that you know people notice that so they realize that you can use that uh to build with um and so using reishi um, and actually oyster and other things as like building material and packing material. And it's, it's gone, it's gone every direction clothing. Um, so using that, the, um, the mycelium and its properties and how it interacts with different substrate, um, which is just what it's growing off of. Um, uh, they've people, scientists, um, uh, some that we at North Spore work with have found, um, you know, incredible properties and, and uses, um, sort of, um, material sciences. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, we're going to have to come back to reishi mushrooms because that sort of really excited you. Yeah, it's a good so, one. The next question is from Devin Bowling. What resources can you recommend for young children to get to learn more about mushrooms? Well, I, I do have it. Uh, so we just, Norspor has done a couple kids classes, um, sort of beta tested them with uh, an organization called Portland Community Squash, um, which is like an, uh, they, they're really cool. Uh, they, it's like an after school program. And yes, they play a lot of squash with kids, but uh, they also do like homework and things like that. And um, uh, uh, we had some activities with them. One thing we did was cooking with mushrooms. And let me tell you, we made them delicious, uh, of course, cause they are delicious. And a lot of the kids sat down thinking that they wouldn't like them. And by the end they were asking for seconds. So we cooked with them and we also found a number of great activities, um, at, uh, on the national mycological society website. They actually have a whole section for teachers. Um, it's really fantastic and comprehensive full of activities. Um, and lesson, lesson plans. And, um, really just, uh, you can kind of go on there and pull out everything you'd need, um, to teach, uh, kind of a, a, a varied age range, uh, about fungi. Wow. And okay. that's NAMA. It's, I think it's N A M A. I don't know if it's org or com, but it's the North American Mycological Association. Association. Yeah. Great. Thank you. 
from Shen Curley, for someone new to fungi who is not going to pursue academically or professionally at least at this point, but is intrigued, what would you suggest for educational resources for someone that has come to love them on hikes? Also, I'm a healthcare provider and would be interested in medicinal education as well. Uh, their New Hampshire programs for report, reporting findings and trackings. Um, well, regarding the, the medicinal education, I know um, the North American Mycological Association keeps a database of poisonings. So that might be something just to check out, just okay. to uh, learn about. Yeah, we sell we sell books. North Spore <laughs> sells a number of uh, uh, a number of um, medicinal books. Uh, one guy, uh, uh, what's his name? Tiro Isocapilla or something. Is that it? Um, uh, he's the guy. He's he's the guy who started. He's a Finnish guy, and he started a company called Four Sigmatic that does like mushroom tea and mushroom coffee and. Um, has really made a big splash. Uh, they've they've really branched out, and um, he has a book called Healing Mushrooms, and it's a very good little book, and it's got great information. It's succinct, and it's got some recipes in it. Um, came out in like 2017, so it's pretty current. Um, that's a fantastic little resource for some of the most well known medicinal mushrooms, like chaga, reishi, lion's mane, cordyceps. Um, so. Uh, definitely worth checking that one out for medicinal mushrooms. Um, uh, there, there is a lot out there. I actually just recently listened to a podcast um, called The Mushroom Hour, and they the the most recent episode or the 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 one before the most recent one maybe. Um, the the guy they were interviewing was a an herbalist, and he had done all sorts of different um, different types of science. Uh, had a very broad background and he was coming out with a book or is coming out with a book uh, all about medicinal mushrooms. That should be a real comprehensive, fantastic book. I'm looking forward to that. Um, what, what else did the question say? I'm sorry. Oh, just regarding um, species in the woods. Um, I would just say that one field guide is probably, is definitely not going to cover you. So it's, you're going to have to acquire um, a few field guides to really get a comprehensive understanding. Um, okay. And there are also sites such as Mushroom Observer where you can go and see what people have reported in your area and you can report your findings and get advice there. Excellent. Um, yeah. Another another is iNaturalist is a, is a good website. Um, and those really have come a long way in terms of what people are, are finding, you know, like the citizen science that's going on there. Um, uh, it depends on the region you are, you know, if, if you're find a book that relates to your region, um, uh, and find a few of them. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Next question. Is there a way to tell if a mushroom is poisonous without risking oneself? No, <laughs> <laughs> there is not. Uh, that is one of the most common questions that we get. Is it, if a mushroom is green and purple or if a mushroom is red, it, no. The answer is no. Um, there are um, a variety of morphologies that you'll see out there. Um, sometimes there are rules for that within a genus, but they're not super broad. Um, and uh, the poisonous mushrooms, you just we, we just have to know them and... and uh, Luckily, there are chemical tests and analyses that you can do. You, we're not we're not in a place in a in time that we have to do it the old-fashioned way and cook them up for dinner to find <laughs> out. Okay, well, that's yeah, interesting. Oh, go please, Rachel. Um, I would just encourage anyone who's interested to join a local mycological society. Um, then you can go out with people who really know these groups. And also when you're picking a mushroom, sometimes people just pick it at the stem and that can be very dangerous. Um, so if you miss uh, a deadly amanita, for example, so you always wanna dig down and get all of the mushroom um, and look for that base and don't just snip it off at the stem. And okay. also familiarize yourself with making spore prints. 
because spore color is an important identification characteristic. Okay. Well, thank you. That's very educational. And as you both started talking about different colors, we have a whole bunch of questions that came in about that. From Ethan Allen, can you name an orange or pink shelf-like mushroom that grows on or next to roots of oak trees? I think you may be talking about chicken of the woods. Um, <laughs> I, and uh, I, I, there are, there's also um, hen of the woods that will grow near the roots of oak trees. That's very delicious and confusing because they've got a very similar name. Um, but the, the hen is also called maitake. But anyway, chicken of the woods. Um, there are really um, two varieties that are most often talked about. Um, Lady porous Cincinnatus and Lady porous sulfurious um and uh when you get it young uh especially it is a very delicious chicken-like mushroom and you can have many many pounds of it uh it's out in abundance right now uh this is the this is the time it comes out th really it can be found may through like october but it's most often you know um early fall uh, is, is when it's kind of popping everywhere Okay, and right. it doesn't have to just be oak either. It can be it can be found on many other varieties of tree. Okay, well, I'm impressed. When I saw that question, I thought you would say, I, I have no idea. Okay. I think that's what the question was about, <laughs> probably. That's a, that's pretty a good beginner species because I don't know of any lookalikes for, for chicken. Do you? None that are none that are orange or, yeah. or pink like that. Like there are some kind of lookalikes, like black staining polypore and berkeley's polypore but neither of those are orange and so like that is just such a uh uh charismatic um indicator that you, nobody should really make that mistake luckily neither of those are poisonous though so if you <laughs> you did that you would just be you know not enjoying a very good meal okay well thank you that was very interesting and another top uh question on that same topic what causes the color variations in fungi do you do you know do you want to take that rachel do you have an, an answer I, I actually got asked this question the other day oh funny you enough. yeah uh well i didn't have i didn't oh, have didn't much find... of an answer like there are <laughs> there are very very um in some cases very unique um compounds that are being uh created um in in various mushrooms like when you cut certain bolletes um, for example, um, uh, they will turn blue rapidly and they'll even stain your hands blue. And, and there are mushrooms that'll stain your hands yellow. And, and, um, and, you know, uh, in, in certain cases, like the blue from a bully is a different chemical than the blue from a lactarius indigo, for example, which is an, another, another thing. So there's a lot of different, um, chemicals that are, pigmented so it's very broad um and and a, a tough question to answer beyond that for me yeah i'm not sure they've even identified all the pigments in, in different fungi so okay um what are some of the more common edible mushrooms that we see in the woods in new england You want to my favorite, my yeah. favorite question. Yeah. Uh, Did you so this here? <laughs> the 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 real mushroom season really picks up um, in July. Uh, it's always like give or take two weeks. This has been kind of a funky season. Um, you know, we had an absolutely drenched July, and it in up here in Maine. Um, uh, in our region too, in southern southern coastal Maine, um, and it really caused an explosion, like a one in five year explosion of mushrooms. Um, and so, uh, bolletes, as I had mentioned, um, is a broad category of of mushrooms, and identification can be very very difficult. But most of them are edible, um, and so there are a ton of edible bolletes. You may have heard the um, uh, uh, mushrooms called porcinis or king bully, um, and those are uh, have been abundant this year. Um, 
black trumpets and chanterelles have been abundant this year. Um, we mentioned chicken of the woods and hen, maitake already. Those are all great edibles. Lion's mane is out now or soon. Um, I'll be looking for bluets in the woods in October. Um, shrimp of the woods. There's a mushroom called the aborted entoloma, uh, which is uh, a very strange mushroom that is uh, often called shrimp of the woods. I can keep on going, but it it, uh, um, it really depends on uh, the, the time of year, the type of uh, habitat you're in. Um, uh, but let's just say there's like, maybe like 15 or so that are like really great and easy to identify too. Um, that, you know, I, I highly recommend most people learn, um, and they can become, you know, uh, adept, pretty adept foragers for life with those, those, you know, choice edibles. Great. Um, Rachel, we see you here. It looks like you're in sort of a lab setting. Can you tell us a little bit about what you, where you are and what you're doing there? Sure. So I'm in the spawn lab of North Spore. Um, and like I mentioned before, um, we start out with a, a Petri dish. So this is a gelatin like substance um, and we have the fungus growing on it. And so then I'll take this plate and I'll take a piece and put it in this bag. And this is a special mushroom growing bag. It has a 0.2 micron filter patch so that air can be exchanged while keeping contamination out. And so this will grow and, and colonize the grain. And then we'll take this bag and make a bigger bag of spawn. And so you can see all the little inoculation points. The fungus is the white part. It's starting to grow. And when it's done, it looks like this. And so this is the start, this spawn is the starting material that people will use to make um, sawdust blocks. And then they can fruit off of those sawdust blocks. So we sell this um, to retail and wholesale accounts. Um, and that's what we do in here. Okay, so we actually have a question similar to that. It says, what does North Spore do? And is buying a kit similar to a Chia Pet like watching it grow or can buyers get more out of it like food um yeah so uh i just just a uh, a note on what rachel was saying well, you you would use that master bag and be able to do like 30 of those oh, spawn yeah. bags so it's like a lot of it's like all extrapolating um we when we um when someone gets our like basic kit, you uh, the toaster sized kit, um, you know they're getting one of four species: uh, lion's mane, pink oyster, golden oyster, or blue oyster. Um, and there's very a little bit of maintenance needed, and you've got to have it in a decent location with decent airflow, not like a ton of direct sunlight. Um, you know, appropriate temperature being between you know, like 50 and 75 degrees, basically. And um, uh, uh, you, you mist it with a little mister or create like a little, a basic humidity chamber um, for it. And your mushrooms will grow and you should harvest them and, and cook them and eat them. And you can get a couple harvests, maybe three. But what happens is eventually the block will dry out. Just misting isn't going to do it. Um, and you could try and soak the block and like, like, uh, drain it really well. Um, and I, I think some people have some success doing that, but you, you do run the risk of, of, uh, contamination at that point, uh, with that much kind of like hydration introduced. Um, it could help to use sterilized water. Um, but, uh, it's really, really awesome at that point to rip the, the kit out of the box and out of the bag entirely and move over to outdoor growing and you could take that block and you could maybe bury it halfway in a, a shady spot in your yard it'll get rained on and it'll produce mushrooms that's really even where it wants to be um in 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 amongst your plants if you have plants you could even break the block up into some wood chips and 
you can potentially colonize those wood wood chips and you're using that block as spawn. Now it's it's weaker because it's already fruited um, and it's it's not as uh, nutritious a, a medium as like grain spawn, um, but it can totally work and produce even more mushrooms for you. Wow, that's great. Now, we mentioned the, the inoculation parties. Do you know what those are? Have you ever participated in any of those? Have, have you, Rachel? Um, I'm just thinking of maybe like a log. I could see a log inoculation party. It was kind of I'm a like, party. Yeah, I'm like, like whoa, like, a, like an inoculation party? That sounds <laughs> sweet. I want to I wanna be part of that. Um, we do, I usually call them classes, but yeah, calling them a party is, is good. Um, we, uh, I'll tell you about the event we just had um, because I'm really proud of it. Um, we partnered with an organization uh, called the Ecology School, actually in the town I live in, uh, call, uh, in Saco, Maine. Um, and they are, they're awesome. And they have a brand new facility, uh, uh, and four miles of trails, riverfront, beautiful. And, um, they, they do lots of events of, of various kinds, a lot of outdoor ed type stuff with students. And then we also partnered with Mafka, uh, the main organic farm and garden association. And we got, uh, 40 people. Um, and we did mushroom stuff all day Saturday and then into Sunday. And we did inoculation. We did, uh, foraging. We had a speaker speak on medicinal mushrooms. We had a, a movie and a mushroom movie at night. And the next day we did like some mushroomy arts and crafts. It was a phenomenal event. Um, and so that was definitely a party. Um, but a lot of times we'll be doing those types of things individually, like a, a just cultivation class or just foraging class. Okay. Um, a question from Sandy Lafleur: What is the difference between mold and mildew? this relevant to this topic? Um, well, I think mildew is a mold, probably. Yeah, I was going to say, I yeah. think those are synonyms. Um, yeah. Those are not like taxonomic classifications. Um, so yes, like powdery mildew is, well. Yeah, so it's sort of like when someone says, uh, says the word um, toadstool. Everyone, people will ask me like, what's a toadstool? Toadstool, it's sort of like a meaningless uh, word. It sort of like doesn't actually distinguish anything. And so I think mildew kind of refers to like mold in certain situations or like certain species of mold. Um, but uh, I am fairly certain that they are, that mildew is a mold. So I think okay. that clears that up. Well, the next question we're getting into a very interesting part of this. How has fungi been used medically to date? So off the top of my head, I could think of um, drug discovery. So yes. the obvious um, penicillin, um, and then there's Taxol, which is a, uh, a drug that was found from, from fungi. Yeah, there, there's um there's a, a mushroom um called turkey tail and turkey tail has been um there have been like like pharmaceutical grade um you know uh tests and extractions done of it and there's a, a drug in japan or i think it's used it's used outside of japan now but it was um developed there called i think it's pdk PD some, something, uh, th uh, three letters. I, I want to say it's PDK. And um, it's been used to um, immunomodulate um, and, and help balance the immune system of, of cancer patients and has been extremely effective. Um, and so a lot of these uh, medicinal mushrooms have uh, uh, beta glucans in them um, and various polysaccharides. Um, that are uh, a really powerful um, immune system. Uh, uh, boost, saying a booster isn't quite the right word, right? So I use the word immunomodulator because a lot of times they just help the immune system do what it needs to do, whether it's um, amp up or, or mellow out. And so um, 
people with autoimmune diseases um, find find benefit. There is a MS medication called Gelenia, um, and it's based off the ex- the um, the uh, some people call it mycopis, um, the exudate um, uh, metabolite from um, some mushroom species. I couldn't find that information, but I I found out that much that it is uh, this was fascinating to me and um and there's definitely uh, a handful more and it certainly depends on what country you're in um where you might find those things but uh, uh more and more doctors are getting on board with with um the herbal side great very educational thank you uh the next question from shen curly what causes the bruising or bleeding of a mushroom Well, there's there's a few answers here that come to mind. One is there is actually, there's a a pretty well-known mushroom called um, Hydnellum pecky or peckii. Um, I never know how to pronounce, you know, most of this stuff. Uh, I don't don't think anybody does, um, but we try our best. Uh, And um, it is, uh, the common name is bleeding tooth and it exhibits a, 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 characteristic uh called guttation and guttation is this um kind of exuding of these water these droplets um it's mostly water uh but obviously it's pigmented in that case red sometimes guttation is like orange um and sometimes it's brown um so that is uh one aspect of it um another is uh, what's pretty, uh, pretty much always referred to as lactation. Uh, there are, uh, there's a genus and, and there's related, um, uh, genera, um, uh, called lactarius and they're, they, they have like a milky, um, often sticky kind of sap, um, that, that bleeds out of them when you break them. And that can be a, a good way to identify them. Um, and some of those are good edibles. Um, so yeah, I think that covers the, the bleeding side. I think bruising is, is often an, uh, an oxidative reaction. Um, uh, um, and, uh, or just like damage to the cells that has released and something's been released. Like a lot of times it takes, you know, being sliced, you can, you can pick up a bully and you can slice it with a knife often, even if it's, you know, and, and wait for bruising. And that is such an important characteristic a lot of times for identification. Um, yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from James Coburn. What are fungi classified, why are fungi classified separate from animals and plants? Yeah. So, um, they're very different from animals and plants. And actually they're more closely related to animals than they are to plants. Um, And they have a cell wall composed of um, chitin. And see, I feel like I'm back in biology 101. (laughs) Um, They, I don't know, I'm, I'm blanking. Can you help? Well, so, yeah. So the, uh, I mean, fungi, well, there, there's a bunch of differences, right? I mean, yeah. uh, the like plants where, whereas they have like cellulose that's versus chitin in mushrooms. And then you have, um, you know, uh, plants go through photosynthesis. That is a huge one, yeah. huge difference, right? Plants, plants are autotrophs. They make their own food. Uh, it's like a totally different process then whereas uh fungi are kind of like us they need to secrete enzymes and digest food and and digest things and and absorb the nutrients they're just doing it outside of uh outside of themselves um they secrete the enzymes out outside of the my uh, from the mycelium and then and then absorb the nutrients in um uh and so that's a big one um another thing that uh alludes to their similarity to us um, that I often bring up is how they breathe. Um, we inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide, 
just like mushrooms. Plants do the opposite. Um, and so that's just a big, a big hint at their, um, closeness to us, um, genetically. Wow. That's very interesting. Okay. We have another question from Ethan Allen. Are there companies in the U S that use fungi blocks as packing material instead of styrofoam? Oh, Rachel said, saying yes. Yes. Um, so <laughs> Ecovative, um, is based in New York. And that is, that's what they do. And we can post links to these um, things that we've referenced later, probably. Oh, sure. That'd be great. Wow. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Are, well, Ecovative, uh, are we still making spawn for Ecovative? We are. I'm not sure if it's, I guess it's not a secret. Yeah. So we, <laughs> we make spawn and they use it in their, pro they, we, they actually use it to make um, fake meat, a meat alternative. But really? they also make packing material. Huh. Okay. So it's a very cool company. Yeah. Next question. Are there any mushrooms that people can eat, but dogs can't? It's a, it's a tough question. I, I want to say like, probably, uh, but, uh, just like there, are, you know, there's tons of critters out in the woods that are eating lots of mushrooms that are poisonous to us that's not an indicator that we can eat something just because right. you see a squirrel right. eating something or slugs munching on something. <laughs> um, so uh, in the same way, you know, dogs are omnivores like us. They've spent a many, many, many generations, you know, adapting to the way we eat, but they still can't eat everything that we eat or, or are not, you know, at their, at their healthiest doing so. Um, uh, mushrooms should always be cooked folks. Um, you should not be eating, Mushrooms raw, really. There's a few, and like it, it pro it's probably not going to kill you to to have a few <laughs> button mushrooms raw, but um, they're they're tastier cooked. Uh, brown them up real good. Um, they are better for you as well because of those tough cell walls. You can't uh, uh, get the nutrition um, really well unless they're cooked. So if a mushroom, if a if a dog were to eat raw mushrooms that dog is much more likely to have some gastric distress because that stuff's tough to, uh, tough to digest. Um, and then, then there are certain, uh, poisons, uh, and toxins that are broken down by the cooking process. So if you had some culinary mushrooms that are cooked well, I mean, it probably shouldn't hurt your dog too much. Okay. But we really, we don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. And also, uh, NAMA does get into uh, pet poisonings on, on their website, oh. so that might be okay. something to check out. And I okay. think um, there's a podcast, uh, a Mushroom Revival podcast, and I think they interviewed a veterinarian. I just can't remember the details of it. Mm -hmm. um, that, that might be also something to check out for pet-specific information. Great. Thank you. Next question. How does climate change affect mushroom growth in New England and beyond? That is a fantastic question. And just like with all species, um, they are affected by habitat loss and, um, and climate change. Um, we, I, I hear people talking about this a lot. I've only lived in Maine for six years. Um, but even in the time that I've been here, I, uh, you know, folks talk about mushrooms that were not previously in Maine that are, are here now. Um, you know, one that comes to mind, uh, I think, I don't think it used to be here was the, the red chanterelle, um, uh, uh the cantharellus cinnabarinus, I think, and they're delicious, uh, but they didn't used to be here. And so there's, there's definitely a, a lot of, um, uh, species that have like moved North. There's others. Um, and so tracking, species that are getting, uh, that are going extinct or getting extirpated or, um, uh, are, are moving around. There has not been a lot of, uh, uh, people keeping track of that sort of thing. Um, but now more than ever, people are through, um, citizen science, uh, and things like mushroom observer and iNaturalist, as well as, um, there's a big effort right now, Paul Stamets and, a bunch of other mycologists are doing this thing called the fungi foundation. It's really cool. Check it out. And, uh, I think one of their big efforts 
has a lot to do with, um, you know, monitoring endangered, um, endangered mushroom species. Okay. Yeah, there is an effort to, uh, to get species uh, red listed. So um, meaning placed on the endangered species um, lists, because that's something that really hasn't been considered in the past. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of this is an issue too, where we haven't documented all the diversity that's out there. So we're probably losing species that we don't even know about right now. Wow. Okay. Next question. Are truffles related to the fungi family? And why are they so expensive? So the, the movie that we watched that I didn't even watch it. The, the movie that we watched at the mycology school at night was this movie called the truffle hunters. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it came out in 2020, actually, and it's all about these Italian truffle hunter guys. And um, I was busy doing some other things while the movie was on and then actually left. So I still haven't seen it. Uh, um, but uh, people enjoyed it. And uh, uh, we've had truffles at Norseport before. They really are absolutely amazing um, little gems. Uh, they're definitely in the fungi family and are uh, what are called sclerotia they are, you know, not mushrooms. They are another um, uh, formation, another sort of organ, um, more for, um, you know, holding nutrients. Um, and uh, uh, their, their, you know, their value is really just their, their incredible cheesy flavor. They've got just this funky un you know indescribable flavor and they're rare because they're hard to find you got to train pigs and dogs and they only grow in certain <laughs> places we we um you know really the only place in the u.s with any significant truffles uh is like oregon washington maybe um but uh we really just don't have them out here um and then italy of course france um uh, maybe a few other places. There is something called the desert truffle that I've really wanted to like explore more about that. Like, I think it grows in the middle East, um, somewhere. Um, but man, once you have good, like real, like black truffle in some like mac and cheese or whatever, uh, <laughs> then, uh, I mean, really just like, just like put that on, um, on an umami flavor and it just multiplies it. It just creates this depth. Um, that is really unbelievable. Um, so the closest thing that we have in New England is black trumpets, for sure, in terms of like flavor. Uh, now that reminds me of something we spoke about the other night. Um, you mentioned something about ground candy caps. Oh yeah, candy caps. And um, what are those? And they're used in cooking, as I understand. Yeah. Um, I could show you them. You want me to go grab them? Uh, they're they're um, they're just in a. I've got them in a jar, uh, and I have a desiccant packet in in the jar to keep them dry. Um, I always recommend that. Too often, people will dry mushrooms and then just just stick them in a jar. You know, uh, over time, if a little bit of moisture gets in there, they can get moldy. They can um, just get get. Uh, oh yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, here they are. I don't have many. I gave I gave some to some people and um, uh, left some on the table, uh, the identification table. We dumped all our mushrooms onto this um, identification table um, at uh, uh, the mycology outside event. Um, uh, but yeah, I can take these now and I can crumble them as sort of an aromatic seasoning. Flavor, they don't have much flavor, but they have this smell like maple. It smells like maple. And it's like kind of adjacent, you know. It's like it's got these other kind of smells too. It's sort of a curry thing. And uh, it'll be really good in some beans or in some chili, um, you know, later on. Especially when I'm missing <laughs> the fall weather, maybe in the middle of winter. So for the chefs in the audience, how would they go about finding these? So I actually, I, you can go online and look up candy caps, dried candy caps, and you can buy them. You can buy it as a seasoning. Pretty sure it's quite expensive. I, I, have, I haven't even looked. I, I haven't even looked because I, you know, I know I can find them for one thing. Um, and uh, 
but I should check. Uh, that'd be really, I'd be really curious. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll definitely make a note of that, but, uh, you're not the first person to ask that you can, you can find it. They, sure. they have a, it's a big thing out in the Pacific Northwest. I think there are like at least one candy cat festival out there. Really? Okay. Fascinating. Thank yeah. you. And what is the role of fungi in nature's life cycle? Yes. Yeah, so, um, fungi, well, the fungi that we're dealing with, um, here are, uh, decomposers. So they're, um, saprotrophic, meaning they decay, um, dead plant material. Um, the species that we are talking about today are wood decay species, and there's different types of wood decay. Most of the species that we work with here are um, white rot species. So they have a, a variety of enzymes and they're able to degrade um, all the major components of wood. So the lignin, the hemicellulose and the cellulose. Um, some other types of fungi are brown rot decayers. And so they don't degrade the lignin and so that lignin is left behind and that contributes to our topsoil. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is an inter interesting question. How can mushrooms help heal the planet? Can they? <laughs> it's, I mean, wow, like what a question. Uh, it is a, it's, it's more about allowing them to keep doing what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> Um, I think than than anything else, right? I mean, understanding that they are such a crucial component in the ecosystem and always have been in most ecosystems, um, and are not just there to break stuff down, but they are also sort of an internet of the forest, and they're transmitting electrical and chemical signals um, between things. Um, I think they can help us understand how important it is to have, for example, um, you know, uh, to minimize tilling in agriculture because you don't want to destroy that mycelial network. Um, I think there's all these other uses that we've talked that we've touched on, like food, um, you know, uh, recycling wastes. Uh, from other other processes, and also making uh, uh, making meat that isn't um, as uh, uh, energy intensive, um, and then of course clothes and all those other things. So it can help. It's just one small, you know, one maybe large piece of the puzzle. But it's it's still the truth is, you know, we have to we have to allow them to do their thing. Okay. Uh, now we're running out of time. So as we wrap up tonight's session, I have one last question for each of you. And that question is, if you want our audience to take away one thing from this Science Cafe, it would be what, Lewis? Um, well, I want everybody to not be afraid of mushrooms. Be curious don't have the mycophobia that's been in our society for gener generations now, you know, for decades and decades. Uh, be curious like you might be um, with something else in your life that, you know, uh, if you have a mushroom growing in your lawn, it doesn't mean you have to put down a bunch of fun fungicide or, uh, you know, uh, just stomp all over it. Um, try to understand it. Uh, try to be, try to, be friends with it, try to use it as a window into learning more about your environment. Thank you. Rachel, one thing you'd like ever to take away from this, what would it be? Yeah, um, just uh, going off what was just said, a common question, a source of confusion, confusion that I hear, um, you can pick up a poisonous mushroom and you'll be fine. You can touch it, just don't put it in your mouth. Um, so yeah, I would encourage everyone to pick up the mushrooms they see and just um, appreciate the, the beautiful diversity of forms that that's out there. As we've touched on, there's there's a wide range of, of um, beautiful morphology to look out out there. So. We got we got info in the chat. Uh, Amazon has dried candy caps for twenty five dollars. <laughs> okay. Thought I'd share that with the viewers. Thank I like you. that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
Okay, now as a reminder to our audience, you can re-watch this episode or you can share it online at our YouTube or Facebook page right after this is done. So in just a few minutes, it'll be available. You can also take a look at our library. We've been, we've been videotaping these for about six years now. So there's quite a few episodes and topics that you might find of interest. And please go ahead and, and look through there and watch any one you want. I want to thank everybody in the audience for taking the time to sit down with us and watch us and submit the questions. Very well done, I appreciate that. Uh, and a very special thanks to Louie and Rachel for being here. They volunteered their time and we appreciate not only your time, but your expertise. It was very educational. So thank you so much. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Okay. Now for everybody else next month, you can join us on October 20th when our topic will be artificial intelligence. And so that concludes the show for this evening from everyone at Science Cafe. Thank you so much for joining us. And to everybody, have a great evening, folks.